Our message this morning is entitled, Ready and Willing. Ready and Willing. Today I want to return to the book of Titus chapter 3, considering an exhortation that we find, a phrase that we find three times in the third chapter of Titus in different forms. In fact, we've already read over one occurrence of this exhortation, one variation of this exhortation, this instruction, in the last three sermons that we delivered from Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. You remember that we first gave a message when we got to Titus chapter 3 on being subject to principalities and powers, obeying magistrates, which is a command of God. It's not a negotiable thing. Number two, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, was our second message. And then last week, we gave you the foundation to those principles in other words, why we do the things that we do, because we ourselves were sometimes foolish, but God has washed us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. He has justified us by His grace through the offering of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, buried in this passage are a couple of words in a phrase that we've read over the last three messages but we haven't commented on it, and we did this intentionally because this is a concept that we find elsewhere in Titus chapter 3. This exhortation is one to do good works. And so our subject today will very much have to do with the subject of Christian living and the fact that Christians are to be people who are always about good works. I intentionally didn't comment on being ready to every good work. You notice that Titus chapter 3, verse 1, to be ready to every good work. Because two other passages in this chapter make reference to that, and I wanted to consider them all at once as we come to the other occurrences of this exhortation. Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, and Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. We'll read those in just a moment. In our message today, we want to take a magnifying glass to the subject of good works and consider, first of all, these three verses and the language of these three verses as they're found in this chapter. And then secondly, we want to spend some time answering the question, what does it mean to do good works? I think that we've all heard sermons on how we should do good works, and how sometimes these messages can even become a little bit lectury, as if the preacher's nagging at you to do something that he thinks that you're not doing. I, I want to present today's message as an encouragement, not necessarily as an act of nagging at you. We've all heard sermons on good works. I think it was actually Brother Danny a few years ago at a meeting at Elgin Crossroads. We were it might have been a fish fry there, I don't remember, but it was probably a decade ago, and there was a, a conversation, there was a sermon maybe about good works, and I think Brother Danny asked the question, we hear about good works all the time, but what, what does that actually mean, right? So we, we hear a lot about how we ought to do good works, what does it actually mean to do good works? What are good works? How do you define that? What do you do to put your finger on that? How do you actually articulate what it means to do good works? That's the second point that we'll consider today, Lord willing. Let's read Titus chapter 3, verses 1, 8, and 14. Paul says in verse 1 of Titus 3, "...put them in mind to be subject to principalities and to powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work." As we read these, you might emphasize in your mind the way these verses are different rather than they are the same. They all include the words good works or good work. Let's notice perhaps in our minds as we read them how they are different. Titus 3.1, be ready to good works. Titus 3.8, this is a new verse to us. We haven't read this yet in our series. This is a faithful saying 
And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. What was different about that verse than the one before? You had ready to every good work. In verse 8, you have careful to maintain good works. Chapter 3 and verse 14. This is in Paul's final remarks in Titus. As you know, as Paul comes to the conclusion of an epistle, his general practice is to just give one after another short, simple statements, sometimes having reference to people that are there that they would know or people that's with him that send word to them, short little statements, little encouragements, one after another, without much of a context, just getting the last little ideas off his chest before he concludes his letter to them. Verse 14, Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. And so you have these three exhortations to do good works, to be ready to every good work, verse 1, to be careful to maintain good works, verse uh, verse 8, and then to learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that we be not, that they be not unfruitful, verse 14. Now, considering the etymology of this, you know I like to do word studies. I think that that's so very important to understanding Scripture, to understanding language. If you don't understand the words that are used, you cannot understand the sentence that is spoken. And I wish that everybody understood that. So many times we read a passage and we think we know what words mean, and then we go and debate and teach and argue even about the meaning of a passage. Well, we don't even know the words that were used There's a reason that God blessed us with dictionaries. God is a God of logic and reason. He's a God of language. He's a God who says words. Even the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, one of his names, one of his titles in the Bible, is in English the word word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word comes from a Greek word logos, which is the root of the English word logic, which means reason. It's also the root of every field of study. Biology is the study of that which is physical. You have geology, which is the study of the earth. You have so many different ologies. Theology, the study of God. The study of a subject, often that word ends with ology, which comes from that word that is one of the titles of Christ, the second person of the Godhead. If there's one thing the Bible is absolutely clear about, God makes sense. He's consistent with himself, with his nature. He is immutable. He cannot deny himself. He is a God of order and structure and logic and reason. He isn't illogical. He isn't unreasonable. But God is a very logical God. As such, he's given us a word And think about the nature of his word. Jesus came to fulfill the word, the law, to what? A jot and a tittle. The smallest marks of punctuation to a Hebrew. When Paul builds his argument on Christ and his Christ being the seed of Abraham and all who belong to Christ being the people who are blessed out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. As Paul writes this argument in Galatians, he says, And not unto seeds as many, but seed as one. That means that by the specificity of what God originally said, Paul builds an entire theological argument. What's my point in saying all of that? Words have meanings. Words matter. When we formulate theology, when we formulate our beliefs, words have meanings Words matter. And so the study of words is so very important to us as we go into Scripture. That was unplanned and off the cuff, but I want you to understand how important it is to know what the words mean when we read words in the Bible. Because of this, I looked them up in the original language. I looked them up as they were translated in 1611. I find as much information about these words as I can. And I often compare to how they're used in other contemporary writings of that day because it helps us get shadings and nuances from the language that was used. 
As we think about good works, I want to define those two. You know what they mean, you know what good means, and you know what work means. The word work is the Greek word ergon, and this is a simple word for, guess what? Work. Does that blow your mind? They translated it correctly. Amazing. But sometimes we do find nuances and shadings as we consider that. There's so many I could bury you with words that might translate different words into one English word and looking at how these distinct words were used is helpful at times. But this word for work simply means work. And it has reference in the Bible to any sort of activity that a man or a woman finds himself doing in the world. There are people who committed evil works, and the same word is used to describe what they did as well. So this isn't a special category of word. This simply has reference to the things that we do. It's no special fancy word. It simply has reference to the things that a man does, either good or evil. This word good is interesting because... As it translates these three times here, it actually translates from two different Greek words, both of which are used in the contemporary Greek language today. Kalo, which is the root word for Greek words like good morning, kalimera, good afternoon, good evening, kalispera, good evening, kalanikta. That's how you greet people today in Greece. The same word is used. And agathos. Now, that's interesting. If you've ever met anyone named Agatha, it's not a word that you use, a name that you hear very much anymore. That's actually literally the Greek word for good. So what does a little mom name her daughter that for? What's she trying to tell the world? It's going to be a good girl. I'm going to name you after a good girl. We, we name our kids appropriately. No one names their child Judas, Cain, Esau, Ichabod. You know, what Ichabod means, the glory has departed. When we were expecting Elijah, I sent my friend uh, Tim McCool an email. I said, hey, brother, we're expecting a little boy in that grade. He said, you should name him Ichabod. The glory has departed. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> With friends like you. <laughs> if, if I'm honest, I, I've done that to a number of people. I won't name which set of twins I encourage to be named Jot and Tittle, who are here in our congregation today. <laughs> you got to have fun you got to have fun in life. There's so much in this world that's depressing. If you don't have fun in life, you're going to be a miserable person. You have got to have fun in life. And things like that are fun. But these words simply has reference to that which is good, that which is wholesome, that which is right, that which is pleasant. And they're even the same Greek terms for good today. Now, that's an amazing thing to think about because 2,000 years have gone by since that original book of Titus, just under 2,000 years, was written, and the very same words for good that he used are used by Greek speakers today. Now, there's a point in that that I want to give you as well, and it applies to us in English also. The New Testament, the Bible, the Greek New Testament, the usage of it, froze largely the Greek language in the form that it was in which the Bible was written, at the time in which the Bible was written. So they write the New Testament in Greek, and it freezes the language. Did you know that, with few exceptions, Hebrew is the same today as it was in the Old Testament? I've not studied Hebrew. That's next on the list. We have a lot of time in life, and there's a whole lot more benefit to learning things like languages than there is scrolling social media. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. But it's amazing that when the Bible goes into a language, through usage, that language freezes in the condition it's in at the time in which the Bible is written. So when God gives the Old Testament, Hebrew kind of freezes in time so that a modern Hebrew speaker... That language had a, actually fell out of use for a while and is now used again, and it's largely the same as it was then. The Greek New Testament is inspired of God, is duplicated, is used among God's people, and it largely froze that language. What do we think about, what do we say about English? Has the Word of God frozen the English language in its present form? Did you know there is Old English that none of us can read, Middle English that few of us can read, and Modern English that began at the late 1500s. What was translated in 1611? 
the King James Bible. And yet every one of us can pick this up some hundreds of years later, 400 years later, 410 years, correct? Yeah. And read it as if it's the newspaper. Somebody's it's got those these and thous and yees and yous. Yeah, because that's singular and plural as pronouns. It's got more in-depth English than we use commonly. Sometimes I do, you know, talk to Rachel with those singular and plural. Thy will be done, honey. Thy will be done. But it froze the English language in its present state. These words for good that come into our language as good are the same Greek words that they use to say something is good today because the Word of God has a way of freezing the language once it's used, once it's given rather, or translated into a language. People use it, they distribute it, and it locks a language in the form largely that it is at that time. The lexicon changes. The definitions of some words change. Now, there are words in the Bible that don't have the same definition as they have today, but largely it freezes the subject and verb, agreement, syntax, etc. Good works, things that we do that are good and wholesome and right and righteous. As a word up front, though we're exhorted here to good works, remember the principle that we've emphasized so much over the past few weeks. We are not saved by the things that we do. In fact, the things that we do not only contribute nothing to our salvation, the things that we have done created the problem that necessitated our salvation. Works done by men is why there is a hell. They are judged according to them. And without our Savior who saved us by His grace, that's exactly where we would all be. We are not saved by the good things that we do. So up front, we have to understand that as we exhort you to good works, it's not so you get to see Jesus after this life. No amount of good works that any of us could do would be sufficient for us to stand before him because we are all condemned criminals. If you committed murder when you were 18 and kept every law of every government over you from that time until you're 30 and justice catches up with you, they're not going to say, well, you've been fine since then. Just don't worry about it. No, you're still condemned. And so good works don't save us from our sins because our sins have already condemned us. As we read in chapter 2, the grace that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, all types of men. We read in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace, by definition grace is unmerited favor, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Works do not justify us. Works do not save us. We are exclusively regenerated. We are regenerated exclusively by the Holy Spirit. And we are justified solely through the Lord Jesus Christ. Works are then to be in response to life. Now as a principle, and this is important for you to understand... In every, in every occurrence of a good work, a truly good work that is viewed by God as a good work, life precedes action. In every instance of anything in the world doing something, they first had to have life to enable them to do it. That's so simple a child could understand it. A dog barks because a dog is alive. You know, we lost our dog back before Christmas, right about the time we were getting over COVID. Nothing's better than standing outside in the rain and burying a 120-pound Labrador when you have COVID. Merry Christmas. So we're standing out there burying the dog. That dog was dead. If it started to bark, I don't know. It would have been like the walking dead. We would have been running into the house. Now imagine if it come out of the ground and started barking now. 
three months later. That'd be a sight. Well, it can't. Why? Because it's dead. Life precedes action. Life always goes before action. A baby cries because the baby is alive. A person is hungry because a person is alive. We all got in our cars this morning and drove out here to church because we are alive. If you remember that principle, it will help you understand biblical theology. To do anything requires life to be given. To do anything that is considered by God as good, we must first be given life. Because prior to being given eternal life, we are what? Dead in trespasses and in sins. And a dead man can do absolutely nothing because he is dead. If a dead man could impact his deadness, undertakers would be out of a job. I don't know, 2020 might have been such a bad year that people were like, you know, I'm going to sleep this one over. Maybe I'll come back next year. Maybe the year after. Maybe 2022. That sounds like a better year. I'll come back to life then. If people could come back to life that were dead, imagine how different the world would be. But they can't because they are what? Dead. Life precedes action. Now, a caveat on that. There were people who were Pharisees. They did religious works. Religion is not a bad word. They did religious works. They looked like they were live living, alive, but they were whited sepulchers. They made clean the outside of the platter, but the inside was full of extortion and excess. It looked like they were doing things that were righteous when they were really, internally, ravenous wolves. I remind you of the book of James. The good things that we do, if they truly are good, are done how? By Faith, the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Any good work that a person does is to be done by faith for it to be actually a good work. Paul wrote in Romans, I believe, that whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. And so every good thing that we do, if it truly is good, is a thing that is done, how? By faith. By Christ in you the hope of glory. You can read Hebrews 11 for a, a nice homework assignment on that one. Good things are done by faith. Things that are pleasing to God are done by faith. Not only does life precede action... But the desire and the ability to do righteous things is of God in you. Notice with me the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God which works in you. Now, back up to chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, that's God performing a good work in you. Good work? Well, here's God doing a good work in you, in saving you. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Once he enters you, once you are regenerated, you never become unregenerated. You never die once you are spiritually alive because Christ never vacates you. Once he begins a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what our old Baptist theologians meant when they would talk about perseverance. They didn't have reference to persevering in complete uprightness like some sort of super saint with no semblance of spiritual trouble in their life. They had reference to the fact that once you are in a gracious state... You stay in that gracious state because Christ never vacates you. Once you are spiritually alive, you have what type of life? Eternal life. Eternal life, by definition, never ends. It isn't term life. It isn't temporal life or temporary life. It is eternal life. And according to Jesus, if you have eternal life... 
I've given them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 10, John 17. He's begun a good work in you. He'll perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This means that the desire to do good works is of God in you. Of being a genitive term. It comes from him in you. Just like you are of your parents, good works are of him in you. This is why scripture defines or describes them rather as the fruit of the spirit. Fruit grows on living trees. And there has to be a living tree to have the fruit. The spirit in you bears fruit. If you have fruit, it is because the spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit. For it is God which worketh in you both to will the desire and to do the ability of his good pleasure. So concerning good works, when you do good works, and we'll try to define those momentarily, understand that the root of that in your heart is God. The desire and the ability to do good, wholesome, righteous things comes from spiritual life within you. Now, to be very clear, this does not mean that God will do the good works in you for you. We are not puppets on a string. Otherwise, what sense would it make for Paul to say, put them in mind to be ready to every good work? You're exhorted to do good works. How? It is him that worketh in you to will and to do. But you must do the good works. You must do. You must act. Salvation is not of him that runneth, nor of him that willeth. Again, this is in response to eternal life. But it is something that we are exhorted to do. And when we do good works, it is God which works in us. People often say, I just want to experience the power of God in my life. Well, there's one way. There's one way. Walk in His Spirit, keep His commandments, do the things He would have you to do, and you experience His presence in your life. Let's begin looking at these three verses one at a time. First of all, Titus 3, 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Ready is a word that conveys to us both preparation and also watchfulness or alertness. If you're ready for something, you're prepared. The scout motto, I, I wrestled with what to name today's message. One of them was be prepared. One of them was locked and loaded. I thought, no, nah, Facebook may flag that one. Locked and loaded. That sounds a little aggressive, right? Okay, maybe not that. Red alert. (laughs) So many different things that you could title a message about being ready to every good work. But when you are ready, you are alert, you are prepared, you're ready to go. When I took martial arts, I had a conversation about martial arts yesterday. I took a couple of martial arts. One was in high school, Japanese form of martial arts. The other one was when I was in college. I took American karate because it was an elective. And I got to go to college and take karate, which, you know, they talk about getting a degree in basket weaving. This is one step above a degree in basket weaving. I could go out to California and make a living with a degree in basket weaving, right? Home of useless degrees. When I took martial arts, we learned about the ready stance. Now, when you take martial arts, there are outright fighting stances that you take. I'm not going to depict any of them. I almost did, and then I thought better of it. There are outright fighting stances that you're in when you're just ready to go. You know, you're just, you're preparing, you're locked and loaded, you're chambered, and you're going to punch somebody. But there's also an in-between stance that is known as the ready stance. And basically when you're in the ready stance in uh, ninjutsu or ninpo, the first martial art that I took, you kind of have your feet, you know, in a, in a nice kind of diagonal way. If you're standing straight like this and somebody pushes you, you can fall backwards. So you have one foot a little bit behind the other. And they would tell you to take your hands and kind of 
kind of just keep them on your, on your side like that, you know, right in front of you. It was kind of casual, never with your hands in your pockets, never with your arms folded, because if somebody attacks you, there's nothing you could do. They'll knock you over. You're not in a fighting stance, but you're also not slack. You're in a ready stance. I thought about that a lot this week, ready to every good work. You're in a ready stance. You're not totally geared. You're not in the midst of combat, but you're ready. Okay? Think of it maybe to borrow science fiction terms, yellow alert. It means that something's going on, but you're not in an all-out battle. All right? So you're ready. You're responsive. You're prepared, but you're not in the midst of it. Be ready to every good work. In that ready stance, you could, in just a moment, go from a battle posture or a fight posture quickly. Now, as we think about being ready, you might say that one who is ready is equipped or mentally prepared, which tells me that if I can be mentally prepared to do good works, I can be mentally unprepared to do every good works. And if I'm mentally unprepared, I'm not going to be successful in doing good works. Let me just say this. Being oblivious and being self-focused, self-consumed, will make us miss the opportunities that God gives us to do good works. I have noticed this in my life. If I ask God for open doors to minister to his people, we always end up with open doors to minister to his people. I looked at Brother Hewlin when I said that because he and I have partnered together for a decade and a half here at this church and... Whenever we ask, Lord, we haven't helped anybody with a power bill in a while. We haven't helped anybody with rent in a while. We've not bought anybody groceries for a while. We'll talk about it, and we'll pray about it. And it seems like within a week, if not two weeks, every single time, every single time, there will be an open door to help somebody. I mean, it's an atheist would have a hard time living through that and not believing in the power of prayer. It happens that many times. I mentioned it. We haven't had anybody to help here recently about three or four weeks ago. Do you remember when I mentioned that? It may have been at the close of service. I prayed that day, and within a week, we had two people to help. One with a utility bill, and another one with a place to stay. I'm telling you, when you ask God for Him to let you help His people, He will give you opportunities to help His people. Over and over and over again. Honestly, the the thought that I've had over this past year is if we spent half the energy, half the emotion, half the mind serving Christ and helping his people that we have spent on politics, can you imagine how much stronger of a church this would be and the one down the road would be and the region of churches would be? And you would be, and Christianity would be, and eventually America would be. If we're oblivious or self consumed, we miss opportunities. Along those lines, and this is confession time, once someone asked for help from our church. And it was in a time when we were doing several things, and I never got back to the person. And it was just a matter of oversight. It it wasn't that we didn't want to help the person, but it was in the midst of some major issues. For probably a year after that, we had no opportunity to help anybody, which is rare. If I ask, or if someone asks me for help, and I don't, God's not going to send me the opportunity. He'll give somebody else that blessing. Do you know it's more blessed to give than to receive? It is a blessing to help God's children. And if he gives me the opportunity and I don't capitalize on it, he'll send someone else that opportunity. So when we ask, he gives. If he gives us an opportunity and we don't capitalize on it, he'll send it to someone else and then we miss out on future blessings that we could have. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over again. Ready to every good work. I'll give you an example of this. Exodus chapter 31. 
as someone who is to be ready to every good work, God has equipped every single one of you with a spiritual gift to be used in his service. Now that may be here. Some of you are blessed with a gift to sing. Some of you are blessed with a gift to use technology. God has used technology in our church to get sermons to people on the radio, on the website, via the podcast, through the live stream. There are people who have come to know our church, if you want to use that terminology, through the means of technology. And I don't know if you're aware of this, you actually have to have a knack for electronics to be able to use electronics. You know, when Ethan's not here, I start getting nervous because somebody has to run the live stream. So I've got that little guy right there that when Ethan's not here, he, it's his job. It's not just something that anybody can do. God has given people the ability to understand how to do it, and we utilize that in our service. Song leaders that have pitch and good time, <clears throat> an understanding of music, it's a blessing to be used in his kingdom. You sisters that know how to cook, as soon as this COVID stuff ends and we go back in there and we start pigging out second and fourth Sundays, I'm telling you what, you have a gift to be used in the service of God. It's the best meal you can get on a Sunday afternoon in North Alabama right here in the lunchroom of Flint River Primitive Baptist Church, and that is a spiritual gift that God has given you. Did you know not everybody can cook? I know that because I'm an expert in eating. And I've known a few people who can't cook. And if he's given you the ability to cook, praise God, use that in his service. All the men folks said, amen. Sure miss eating here at church. Soon, 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 we're going to be back to doing that. God gives you an ability to do something, and God gives you an opportunity to use that ability. I noticed this this past week in my Bible reading, Exodus chapter 31, and it's just a simple little narrative about some of the items that were found in the tabernacle eventually in the temple. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now, we've never heard the name Bezalel. I imagine none of us have heard a sermon on Bezalel. Not one of the most famously referenced people in the Old Testament. But notice what he says. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. My mind perked up when I read that. This, you have a reference of someone being filled with the Holy Spirit in Exodus 31. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. To devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. He goes on to refer to some of the other people to build some of the furniture and such that's in the tabernacle. But did you catch what God said about that man? I've called him by name. I've filled him with the Spirit. And I've given him wisdom and understanding and workmanship that he may what? That he would use the ability that I have given him in the tabernacle. Now, I'm standing behind a pulpit of wood that one brother in our congregation, Brother Hewlin, made. He made the table that's down front. He made my desk. He made the bookshelves. He made the cabinets. He made the island. You start looking around this place at all the things that Brother Hewlin has made, and it really is amazing. He did that because God had called him, filled him with the Spirit, wisdom and understanding, and gave him a gift in all manner of craftsmanship that he might do, that he might use that in the service of God. Now, some of you, it might be different things, but God calls you, he fills you with the Spirit, he gives you wisdom and understanding and some skill, and then you use that in his service. I promise you, you don't want to see a cabinet that Ben Winslet makes. That's not my gift. I can make one great website and I can use technology and I can plan and hang wires and install cameras and mics. But you don't want to see my woodworking. I don't want to see my woodworking. 
It's not something that I have an interest to do. But some of you have that gift. God gives you a gift. He gives you a calling. He gives you an ability. And then you walk in that to his glory. Now, I thought about this this week, too. God tells Moses about that brother and says, I've given him this ability, this calling, and I want him to do this in my house. Sometimes when God gives you an ability and a calling to do something in his house, you have a burden to do that and other people don't understand it. I imagine there were people that looked at him and said, who does he think he is? Why is he building all that furniture for the house of God? Fortunately, they had that word. But we run into this as pastors all the time. We have a a burning, a desire to do something, a burden to do something, and not everyone understands it. Be understanding, be aware that when you begin to walk in the burdens that God has given you to serve him, and of course everything that we do to serve him has to be according to this word, but when you begin to walk in those and to do that and to obey him, there will be people who look at you and say, I have no idea why he's doing that. Why is he doing that? live stream. There was one brother that I know of who was live streaming before us and people talked bad about him for doing it. I started live streaming because I said, hey, that's a great idea. It's like radio only free. And, you know, then people who are not at church can watch if they're homesick. Slowly, a few other churches began to do it. About a year ago, about a year ago, When churches around this country shut down because we had no idea what was going on with this virus, we'd never heard of it, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know how severe it was. Is it it the next bubonic plague? Is it MERS? MERS is a coronavirus that kills 35% of people that catch it. That's terrifying. Churches in the shutdown began to call and pastors and deacons and people. I was on the phone 10 to 20 hours a week with people telling them how to live stream. And now you've got dozens and dozens of Primitive Baptist churches that live stream. Sometimes when you have a burden to do something, people look at you and they think, why in the world is he doing that? Because God told you to and he equipped you to and he'll bless you to. So what do you do? You do it. You get busy doing it. You get busy doing what God has called you to do. You got to be ready you got to be standing it ready. You're watching, you're vigilant, you're observing. Don't be fearful. You just remember those builders in Exodus 31. If God called you to do it and he enabled you to do it, he expects you to do it. So go do it. Titus 3.8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. I like the word affirm. Affirmation, it's a biblical term. There are things that we affirm and there are things that we affirm against. That's a phrase that you should learn. Affirm constantly that they which have believed in God, that's you, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. Believer, be careful to maintain good works. How many of you just thought of the passage from Philippians? Be careful for nothing. The only exception that I know of in the Word of God to be careful for nothing is be careful to maintain good works. The word careful means full of care. To be careful is to be full of care. We are to be careful for nothing. I quoted that passage dozens of times a year ago. Do not be afraid. Do not be full of fear. Be careful for nothing. Sure, be cautious. Sure, take precaution. You know, I ride with my seatbelt on for a reason. It's not because I'm afraid. It's because it's just good common sense. A lot of other things we do, not because of fear, but because it's common sense. But be careful for nothing. The only thing that the Bible ever tells us to be careful for, full of cares about, is that we would be careful to maintain good works. Now think about that word maintain for a moment. It means, this means that good works are to be a regular part of the life of a Christian. To maintain good works. To keep it up. You know, buildings take maintenance. We maintenance the building here and it takes cleaning, it takes repairs. 
It waxes old. The beating of the sun and the rain and the wind upon it can have an effect on it. It wears the roof out. It makes the paint peel off on spots that still have paint. Most of it's covered in vinyl or aluminum, but and we have the brick all around it. If you ever look at the paint that's between on, on the siding, you know, this building was originally siding and then it was bricked over. If you go in the crawl space, you can see the old, uh, the old siding. And it's just layer over layer over layer of chipped off cracking paint because of the sun. It took maintenance, and they put this lower maintenance brick on it because it's easier to deal with, but the yard needs maintenance. The parking lot needs maintenance. We know what it means to maintain something, to maintain something. Good works take maintenance. This is a matter of endurance. I had the thought this weekend, think of your day each and every day as a flower arrangement or a bouquet. And every little good thing that you do by faith is one more flower on that arrangement. Make your life, make your day a flower arrangement full of beautiful flowers, good works, and of course, as we know from Matthew 5, 16, that others might see your good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Good works are not for the purpose of you and I glorifying ourselves. They're not for the purpose of, as the Pharisees said, look at what I have done. You remember the Pharisee that goes in the temple to pray, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men. Lord, I pay tithes. I fast twice in the week. And I, I so thank you that I'm not like this publican over here the whole while the publicans publicans smiting his breast saying lord have mercy unto me a sinner and you know of the two of those the publican went home justified not the pharisee we don't do this for the sake of saying look at what i've done we do this to bring glory to god what a selfless motivation it ought to be and is when we serve god with good works in his church has nothing to do with us and everything to do with his glory. These are profitable unto men, that is to say they are helpful, they are beneficial. Verse 14, this is interesting language. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Let ours also learn. If you read that in commentaries, most of the time they'll say, ours as in our people, as in all of the church, as in God's people no matter where they are. To me, what Paul is doing is making this personal. He addresses all who believe in verse 8. Them that believe in God, that they would be careful to maintain good works. Here... Let ours also learn to maintain good works. He shifts the focus to those most closely associated with him. It's easy to look at someone a thousand miles away and say, they need to learn to maintain good works. Paul says, let ours learn to maintain good works. In my opinion, making that far more personal. Let us learn Learn to maintain good works. This is a discipline. Now, I didn't save a whole lot of time to answer the question, what are good works? The first thing that I would say is that attending worship is simply a given. Attending worship, being a part of the church of the Lord Jesus, is a good work. It is one that we are to do. On the flip side of that, notice Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. How much provoking unto other things did we see over the past year? Let us provoke one another to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. To forsake the assembly is sin. And so we ought to exhort one another as we see the day approaching to be here 
to present our bodies a living sacrifice, to be a part of the house of God. The word church means a symbol. Now, there are obviously times when things hinder us from that, and Scripture makes allowances for that, but it must never become a pattern. It is so easy to fall into the pattern. Somebody said recently, if you miss church too much, you won't miss church. And you have to think about that to get the point. If you miss attendance, you soon won't miss being there, is the point. We have done everything in our power over the past 12 months to make you feel and be as safe as possible as you gather in worship so you will not fear being here. I know pastors that have dealt with 40% attendance, 30% attendance. A church with about 50 members about four Sundays ago had 10 people there because people are afraid to come to church. Why did we do all these things? To make you feel safe. And we have 80 to 90% attendance. I think there's a correlation. Because I wanted you to be here. If you don't feel safe in here, there's a room over there that's got lots of room. We'll put you in the cry room. We'll put you in the sound room. I'll mark off a bathroom just for you. We'll find a space for you if you're afraid to be here because I want you to be here. It's that important. Good works number one. First, attending worship is a given. The word church means assembly. If I don't assemble, can I call myself church? Secondly, the disciplines. When we talk about the disciplines, we have reference to reading, prayer, and singing. Reading the Bible is a discipline, and things that are disciplines are not easily done on a regular basis. A person that is very disciplined might not eat unhealthily. A person who is very disciplined might keep a strict workout regimen. Do you enjoy working out? Very few of us enjoy working out. Rachel made me do Zumba yesterday. It was awful. It was terrible. She took a picture of me collapsed half on the couch, half in the floor covered in sweat. It was misery. I think, how do people do that? And she's over there cheering. I'm like, what are you thinking? I like lifting weights because it makes me feel all macho. Look at me. I can pick up all this weight. There's nothing macho about dancing around in my living room. Anyway, that's about the last thing you feel is macho. But it's a discipline to work out and stay in shape. It takes discipline to read the Word of God. I've been so convicted over the past three or four years. I read all day. I read Facebook post after Facebook post, after tweet after tweet, after Instagram after Instagram, after YouTube after YouTube. You put the amount of time we all spend scrolling social media next to the amount of time we spend reading God's Word, and I think we would all be ashamed and embarrassed myself on the top of the list. We ought to maintain the good work of reading God's Word. Prayer, the most unutilized, untapped resource in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not because you ask not. Let us boldly come to the throne of grace that we might obtain help in time of need. Singing. Singing is a good work because God is to be praised. That's why we have 30 minutes of singing at the beginning of our service. We started late today because I was in the back and didn't pay attention to the time. We ought to be ready here at 1020, waiting for the song service, eagerly waiting to start worshiping God. I know sometimes it's hard, but he deserves it. Singing is a part of what we ought to do under the umbrella of good works, the disciplines, reading, prayer, and singing. Imagine if all the time that we spent doing other things this past year had been devoted to those three alone. Lastly, thinking about good works, and there's so many things we could talk about. The way that you are in your home. We, we talked about so many of those in chapter 2. Everything we read in chapter 2 about the aged men, the aged women, the young men, the young women, servants and masters, falls under the umbrella of doing good works. But lastly, charity. Giving. Helping the poor. 
It's our privilege to give to the church, to the furtherance of the gospel. It's our privilege to give to the poor, to the homeless. James chapter 1 says that pure religion and undefiled before the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. It's amazing that pure religion before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless. And by the way, the fatherless have a father. They have a father. God's fatherless children, if a, if a child of God, his father dies, he has a father in heaven. And the widow whose husband dies has a husband in Christ. But it's our privilege to visit those who can't care for themselves in their affliction. Now, we can do this simply by giving, obviously. But it's a lot harder to get our hands dirty and actually help the people that need it. I loved a few years ago, November of 2016, when a tornado came through here to see the way you guys went into action on the roofs, helping people patch their roofs and to, to cut up the trees that were down in their yard. And, you know, we've this church has sent people and things to... More than one hurricane as it's impacted the coastline. It's our privilege to help, and those helpful behaviors are good works. We give in time. Some of you might say, I don't have a lot of money to give. But maybe you're blessed with a heart that's cheerful. Maybe you're blessed with good health and two hands that can get busy. There's always someone to help. Mark Green preached a sermon years ago at Ebenezer, and he was talking about innovations to church, and he said, if you really live out James chapter 1, you won't have time for innovation. You will have no time for innovation if you devote yourself to serving the fatherless and the widows, to visit them in their affliction. And I might add, to visit them in their affliction means to pay more than to pay them a visit at their home and sit and have coffee with them, though that is a part of it too. You do something to alleviate the affliction. Now, I just want to end today as we're careful to maintain good works and we think about being a part of the church. Secondly, the disciplines of reading and praying and singing and lastly, charity, doing kind things for people. Is this a priority to you? Let us learn to be careful to maintain good works for necessary uses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us the will. Father, thank you that you've given us the ability. Now, I pray, Father, that this sermon would serve as motivation to get out and do the things that you would have us to do. Lord, it wasn't our intention to be naggy. This is a fun subject. Nothing could be more invigorating because it is more blessed to give than to receive than to take of what you have blessed us with and bless another with it. We pray, Father, that you open doors for us to help your children in this community. We pray, Father, that we would be here on Sunday morning worshiping, gathering in worship because you've commanded us to. We pray, Father, that we would be reading your word every day. We pray, Lord, that we would pray, that we would hit our knees night and day, that we would ask for your grace, for your blessing, for your leadership, for your protection, for clarity on how to navigate this world around us at present. We pray, Father, that you would enable us to sing with our hearts and that we would be filled with the Spirit as we sing. Lord, bless all that are here today to work in whatever capacity, whatever calling you've given them. And we pray, Father, that we would learn to maintain this, that it would be a priority, that it would be a joy, that we would be like so many of those saints in your word who addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Lord, forgive us for the many times when we haven't, for we know that we have not. Help us to do better, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah.